Let's look at Luke chapter 19, the first four verses. And he entered and was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Yeshua was. And he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. And he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. So as Yeshua passes through Jericho, there's this little guy. And he is a chief tax gatherer. And he wanted to see Yeshua. Now a tax gatherer in that day. They were, they were not well liked, okay? And what they would do is that, uh, what the Roman Empire would do is get people from that, like, vicinity, that neighborhood, to be the tax gatherer for a certain area, okay? And what he would do, they'd say, you need to gather this much in taxes, however much it was. And you got to get it from the people, and they got to pay you. And if they don't, then our soldiers, soldiers will come and talk to them, okay? And they'll give up the money. So the tax gatherer, and by the way, you determine your own wage as a tax gatherer. So however much you gather, you got to give the uh, you got to give Rome theirs, and you keep the rest. So how much did they gather? A lot. Okay. So tax gatherers were rich. Well, the story goes: this little short tax gatherer, he climbed a sycamore tree so he could see Yeshua. Verse 5, and when Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. <clears throat> and when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. So Yeshua told Zacchaeus, he says, I'm going to stay at your house. And the people who saw this, they said, Yeshua, now he's staying at the house of a man who's a sinner. Being a chief tax gatherer, and they say he was rich. Now, you only, only one way you get rich is a tax gatherer. That's by stealing. <clears throat> That's apparently what he did. Verse 8 of Luke 19, And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the master, Behold, master, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give back four times as much. You know, that response here, very interesting. He said he'll give half of everything he has to the poor, which was a substantial amount, I'm sure. And also he'll repay everyone he's defrauded four times as much. Now, if you defraud somebody or rob them, how much do you have to pay back, according to the Torah? 20% more. That's it. It's in Leviticus 6, starting at verse 1. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, When a person sins and acts unfaithfully against Yahweh, and deceives his companion in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him, or through robbery, or if he is extorted from his companion, or has found what, is, what was lost and lied about it and sworn falsely, so that he sins in regard to any one of the things a man may do. Then it shall be, when he sins and becomes guilty, he shall restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by extortion, or the deposit which was entrusted to him, or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he swore falsely, he shall make restitution of it in full and add to it one-fifth more. He shall give it to the one whom, to whom it belongs on the day he presents his guilt offering. Then he shall bring to the priest his guilt offering to Yahweh, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation for a guilt offering. Now, according to the Torah, if he stole sheep, he has to pay back fourfold. In Exodus 22, 1, if a man steals an ox or a sheep, and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Well, apparently Zacchaeus wants to make abundant restitution for his sins. And it's probably going to cost him everything he has. That would be my estimation. Verse 9. And Yeshua said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. Yeshua calls Zacchaeus a son of Abraham. This is indicative that he is a son of Abraham because of his righteousness. Okay? Now, the Pharisees called themselves sons of Abraham through blood, the bloodline. And John the Baptist said, These stones over here, he can break sons of Abraham out of there if he wanted to. Who do you think you are? But 
They, hmm? oh, but they, uh, he's being called a son of Abraham through righteousness. In Romans 4, Paul talks about this, starting at verse 10. How then was it reckoned while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. He's talking about the covenant with Abraham. Was that covenant with Abraham made when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? It was before circumcision. It's when he made that covenant. And he received the sign of circumcision. A, the seal of the righteousness of the faithfulness which he had while uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be reckoned to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faithfulness of our father Abraham, while he, which he had while uncircumcised. Uh, once again, very important to replace that word faith with faithfulness, because that's what's intended there. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the Torah, but through the righteousness of faithfulness. For if those who are of the Torah are heirs, faithfulness is made void and the promise is nullified. You know, why was Abraham chosen to make that covenant? It's because he was obedient to the Father in everything he did. And it was through righteousness that that covenant was made, not through a rightfulness due to a bloodline. For the Torah brings about wrath, but where there is no Torah, neither is there violation. You know, uh, those that say, well, I'm saved because I, I keep the law. Well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you probably broke the law sometime in your life, and probably something that would cost you your life. So where's your salvation in that? It's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he says, for this reason, it's my faithfulness that it might be in accordance with, gra with graciousness of the Father, in order that the promise may be certain to all descendants, not only to those who are of the Torah, but also of those who are of the faithfulness of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And uh, Paul also writes in Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Heirs of what? The Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. That's the covenant that was made with Abraham. And keep in mind, that, that covenant with Abraham wasn't really for Abraham. It's for his descendants. It's for his descendants. They're the ones that benefited. We're the ones that benefit from that. And why are we saved? Because the Father is faithful. And we're saved by his graciousness, due to his faithfulness to keep that promise to Abraham. <clears throat> um, Yeshua tells us that we are sons of Abraham if our actions are like Abraham's actions, or if our faithfulness is like Abraham's faithfulness. That's in John 8, starting at verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. This Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. We're not born of fornication. We have one father, even Elohim. Did you catch that? What they're saying to him? By the way, they know who he is. But what are they saying here? Um... Uh, we're not born of fornication. What are they saying? What are they implying? You were. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeshua said, said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from Elohim. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You're of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand with the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Verses 10 and 11. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And while they were listening to these things, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of Elohim was going to appear immediately. 
Now, I thought that was interesting. Why did they think it was going to appear immediately? Um, the key is the words, of, in the words of Yeshua. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It was prophesied that Elohim would seek and save the lost, and then the kingdom arrives. That's in Ezekiel 34, starting at verse 15. I'll feed my flock and I'll lead them to rest, declares Adonai Yahweh. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I'll destroy. I'll feed them with judgment. And as for you, my flock, says Adonai Yahweh, behold, I'll judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the goats. Also in Micah 4, verses 6 through 8, In that day, declares Yahweh, I'll assemble the lame, gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. I'll make the lame a remnant. The outcast a strong nation, and Yahweh will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. And as for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. That's why the people said, well, well it's here now, right? It's, the kingdom's here. It's going to come right now, right? Not exactly. The kingdom's here, but not in the form that they're wanting it. It was there. Yeah. Not the, they're ready, yeah, they're ready to, for, for the kingdom to take over the world. Yeah. Verses 12 and 13, he said, Therefore a certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business until I come back. The word with this is not in there. It's italicized. It was added to help you understand it better. But actually, it reads better without that in there. Uh, what's a mina? It's a bird that sits on your shoulder, right? No. You don't think he gave that guy ten birds to sit on his shoulder? <laughs> no. A mina is a Greek monetary unit. It's also a Hebrew monetary unit. Now, one mina is worth about 50 shekels. That is the salary of your average working man for about two or three months. That's what a mina is. <clears throat> um, what is meant by this precious money given to the, to the slaves, to his servants? You know, the minas are, a, this is a parable, it's all, it's all symbolic. The minas are a reference to the Torah or his word. In uh, Job 28, starting at verse 12, where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me, and the sea says it's not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. Psalm 119, verse 72, the Torah of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Psalm 19, verses 9 through 11, The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. They're more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Proverbs 3, verses 13 through 15, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. For its profit is better than the profit of silver, and its gain than fine gold. She's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Uh, Proverbs 8, verses 10 and 11, Take my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choicest gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. And just one more, Proverbs 16, verse 16, how much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. So <clears throat> what he's talking about here is the binas, this, this lot of money that he's given these guys, is symbolic of the word of the Father and his Torah and his ways. So this parable is about people dealing with his word and living according to his, to his word until he returns. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. Well, the nobleman is Yeshua. Okay, the people rejected him. 
Yeshua, uh, he was hated by them, and he's going to leave others in charge is what he's going to do. All right? Verse 15, it came about that when he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him in order that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your two minas, uh, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, be an authority over ten cities. You see, the master's going to return. He's going to settle all accounts. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we, all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Psalm 7, verses 6 through 8, Arise, O Yahweh, in your anger, lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries, and arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment. And let the assembly of the peoples encompass you, and over them return you on high. Yahweh judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Yahweh, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8, But Yahweh abides forever. He has established His throne for judgment. He'll judge the world in righteousness. He'll execute judgment for the peoples with equity. Uh, the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear Elohim and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For Elohim will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Oh, you want the answer to what this parable is about? That's it right there. Ezekiel 18, starting at verse 30. Therefore I'll judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares Adonai Yahweh. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares Adonai Yahweh. Therefore, repent and live. Now, the servant had been very faithful. And he was rewarded with authority over ten cities. Let's go back to Luke 19, verses 18 and 19. And the second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Well, the master congratulated the next servant. He was obedient and he prospered which is part of the Torah also. In 2 Chronicles 31, <coughs> verses 20 and 21, And thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good, right, and true before Yahweh his Elohim. And every work which he began in the service of the house of Elohim in Torah and in commandments, seeking his Elohim, he did with all his heart and prospered. Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, and in his Torah he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8, Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the Torah, which Moses my servant commanded you, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have success. See, following the Torah and prosperity go hand in hand. I don't know, uh, maybe some, some of us don't feel prosperous, but we are. We're very prosperous. Verses 20 and 21. And sometimes prosperity won't come until later. And another came saying, Master, behold your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. So this guy brought back his one mina. He knew that Elohim was a, a hard man, an exacting man. What he's saying is, I know you're a righteous judge. And you're a tough one. And he's correct. He is. Job 21, 
verses 14 through 18. And they said to Elohim, depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreat him? Behold, their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Malachi 1, verses 12 through 14. But you are profaning it in that you say the table of Adonai is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is and how disdainfully you sniff at it, says Yahweh of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, and you bring the off so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says Yahweh? Be cursed, but cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to Adonai. For I am a great king, says Yahweh of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. <clears throat> See, this man was so afraid. You know what he did? He went and hid the word of the master in the ground instead of performing it. He went and hid it. He was so afraid. Revelation 21, verse 8 says, uh, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. <clears throat> Let's go back to Luke 19, verses 22 and 23. He said to him, By your own words I'll judge you, you worthless uh, the New King James says, you wicked slave, and that's probably a better translation. Uh, but if you, if you try to interpret the parable literally as a story, worthless makes more sense. But it's a parable, it's not literal. He's, uh, because just on the surface of the story, the guy wasn't wicked, he was just worthless. But the word in, in the Greek actually means wicked. Okay, he was wicked because he didn't handle the Father's word at all. Did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put the money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. So this guy's wicked. That's a reference to a lack of good works and doing evil or against Torah ways. Psalm 119, verse 53, burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your Torah. The slave knew of Elohim, but he didn't heed his word. Now, verse 23, very interesting. Why did you not put the money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected, collected it with interest. What could that mean? Okay, the term for this is usury, right? Charge interest, that's usury. Usury can't be charged to a brother or a neighbor, but it can be charged to a foreigner. Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 and 20. You shall not charge interest to your, countrymen's, to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest. You may charge interest to a foreigner, but to your countrymen you shall not charge interest, so that Yahweh your Elohim may bless you in all that you undertake in the land which you're about to enter to possess. You know what this is a reference to? What he's saying? He's saying at least some of those outside of Israel, the others, could have benefited from your obedience. Just a little bit. But you didn't think enough to even be obedient to me because you were scared. You went and hid it. Didn't have the courage to be obedient in front of the Gentiles even. Verse 24, and he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has more will be, uh, shall more be given, but from the one who does not have even what he does have shall be taken away. <clears throat> everyone who has, maintains, regards Torah, shall have an abundance. Those who do not will have everything taken away. Hosea 2, verses 9 through 11, Therefore I will take back my grain at harvest time and my new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Then I'll uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. And I'll put an end to all her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festal 
assemblies. They'll be cast out of the kingdom into outer darkness. Verse 27. But these enemies of mine, who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Those who reject him and reject him ruling over him will be slain in his presence. Reject him and his ways and his, reign, his reigning over the people. Yes. Psalm 69, starting at verse 22, may their table before them become a snare. When they're in peace, may it become a trap. May their eyes grow dim so they cannot see and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation on them. And may they, thy, your burning anger overtake them. May there can't be desolate. May none dwell in their tents. For they have persecuted him whom you yourself have smitten. And they tell of the pain of those whom you have wounded. Do you add iniquity to their iniquity? And may they not come into your righteousness. May they be blotted out of the book of life. And may they not be recorded with the righteous. Isaiah 66 verse 6. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of Yahweh who is rendering recompense to his enemies. Then skipping down to verse 14, then you shall see this and your heart will be glad and your bones shall flourish like the new grass. And the hand of Yahweh shall be made known to his servants, but he shall be indignant toward his enemies. For behold, Yahweh will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For Yahweh will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh. And those, <clears throat> and those slain by Yahweh will be many. Who sanctif those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens. Following one in the center. Who eat swine's flesh. Detestable things and mice shall come to an end altogether, declares Yahweh. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. Um, that's a horrifying passage right there. Well, Jesus doesn't care if I have bacon with my eggs in the morning, does he? Says he does, yeah. Says he does. He says, I didn't make that for food. In the book of Nahum, Nahum uh, 1, verse 2, a jealous and avenging Elohim is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Then down to verse 8, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Okay, let's go back to Luke 19, verses 28 and 29. And after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, ascending to Jerusalem. And it came about that when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples. Okay, now Bethany is on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, and Bethphage is on the other side of a ravine from Bethany. They're very close to Jerusalem. And I, I had to rotate the names here. They're just on top of each other here where Jerusalem is. <clears throat> Verses 30 and 31 saying, go into the village opposite you in which as you enter, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Thus you shall speak. The master has need of it. Uh, it's likely Yeshua set this up with the guy. Okay. Said, I'm going to be coming back uh, next month, passing through here. I need to borrow one of your donkeys and you're welcome for healing your son. I think that's what happened. I don't think this is a supernatural thing. Verse 32, And those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The master has need of it. So this guy, he readily agrees to do it when he hears who wants it. I think it was a, a prearranged situation. Verse 35, And they brought it to Yeshua. And they threw their garments on the colt and put Yeshua on it. And as uh, he was going, they were spreading their garments on the road. Now, um, they threw their garments on the road in front of him. Why would they do that? It was the way. Ah, kinda. This was this was actually an ancient custom in Israel. This declared Yeshua as king of Israel. Uh, it's the same greeting that was given to. 
uh, Yehu, which means Yahweh is he, when he was made king. That's in 2 Kings 9, verse 13. And they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Yehu is king. So it was the custom to, to greet the new king. Yeah. The, the donkey is symbolic of royalty also. Yes. Verse 37. And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise Elohim joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they'd seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of Yahweh. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. <clears throat> okay, you see the, the capitalized letters there. That means it's a quote from the Tanakh. And this comes from Psalm 118. And starting at verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is Yahweh's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which Yahweh has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Yahweh, do save, we beseech you. O Yahweh, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the house of Yahweh. Now, in this psalm here, you see in verse 25, O Yahweh, do save, we beseech you. That is the Hebrew two words, Yasha Anna. And that's where we get the word Hosanna. It was, it's from Yasha Anna. And it means, O Yahweh, we beseech you to save us. And in that same cry, and bring prosperity. Because that's what comes with the kingdom. <clears throat> and the donkey here, its arrival, it's a fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And as Cliff brought up, don't, don't be fooled by the donkey thing. That's a, that's a sign of royalty in that day. Uh, they talked about some of the kings uh, in Israel before, and they would say, and he, and he had a stable of 30 or 10,000 donkeys or whatever for his sons. That was a sign of royalty. Verses 39 and 40. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. The, Yeshua is telling the Pharisees uh, that he's the Messiah. He's the guy. This is the time of Messiah. And all the earth will rejoice. In Psalm 96, starting at verse 11, Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice, let the seas roar, and all it contains. Let the field exult, and all that is in it. Let all the trees of the forest, oh, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before Yahweh, for he's coming. For he's coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Psalm 98, starting at verse 7. Let the sea roar, and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Before Yahweh, for he's coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And let's look at Psalm 114, starting at verse 1. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strong language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like, the, like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee, O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like rams, O hills, like lambs. Tremble, O earth, before Adonai, before the Elohim of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of water. So that's what he's saying. The stones will cry out if they don't. This is the day. This is the time. Verse 41. When he approached, he saw the city and wept over it. Remember this. Very important. Saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side. 
So this is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Yeshua knew that the people were going to reject him. It was prophesied that after they rejected him, Jerusalem would be destroyed. Yeshua will prophesy on this in greater detail in Luke 21. And just, we'll go into it in detail then, but he said, uh, starting at verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of the city depart. And let not those who are in the country enter the city because... These are days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's important too. Look at verse 44. And will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now, that's a very interesting way to put it. He specifically said Jerusalem's going to be destroyed because they didn't recognize the time of your visitation. How could Israel recognized the time of the visitation of Messiah. The reason being is that it's spelled out for them in Daniel chapter 9. Starting at verse 24, let's take a look at this passage and let's see what transpired. Starting at verse 24, Daniel 9 reads, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, 70 weeks. Uh, that, that Hebrew word for weeks, it's the word Shabuah. It just means a seven. All right? It's like our word dozen. Okay? We don't know seven what's. We don't know, you know, if I ask for a dozen, you may bring eggs. But I, I meant two six-packs. Okay? <laughs> so just depends on your reference, your point of reference. So using the term week is a good, a good word to use. But it doesn't mean seven days. It just means a seven. But a week is a group of a seven, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's used, and it's good. And... Uh, Gabriel here is talking, and he's saying here there are 70, 70 sevens that have been determined for your people and your holy city, by the way. Your holy city, too. And, you know, but 70 what? It could be 70 sevens of days, weeks, years, months. In the context of this verse... It's plain Daniel was reading in Jeremiah about 70 years, and it appears this, this is referring to years. Now, why were the Israelites held in captivity for 70 years? Why was this? They didn't keep the land Sabbaths. They didn't keep the land Sabbaths. That's, uh, that's correct. Uh, and that's in Leviticus 25. Six years you shall sow your field, six years you shall prune your vineyard, gather its crop, but during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest. And the Sabbath to Yahweh you shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. So, see, what does that hurt, though, to not, to not uh, prune your vineyard and gather its crop on the seventh year? What does that hurt? That's a year's income. So for 490 straight years, they didn't obey this. And Elohim says... Uh, that's, my land is going to get its rest. So they were taken out of the land for 70 years. So it got its, its, seven, its 70 years back. Now the uh, Israelites, uh, he led them back after the 70 Sabbath years had passed. In Second Chronicles 36, starting in verse 20, And those who had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia 
to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths all the days of its desolation and kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So that's it. Now, um, let's take a look at this passage again. And we're going to look at verses 25 and 26 with it. It says, Seventy sevens have been decreed for your people in your city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the sixty-two sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Well, the 77s here are broken up into three segments. There's seven of them. Then there's 62 of them. Then there's one. That's how it's broken up. Now, Daniel, you know, if you've studied the book of Daniel, he had all these visions, and they were really awesome visions of world kingdoms and stuff. And he had, to, he had to be thinking, well, there's a lot of world kingdoms that are still going to be coming and going. What do these 77s have to do with my people and fitting in with all those kingdoms? He had visions in chapters 2, 7, and 8, which were phenomenal. Now, Daniel wanted to think that at the end of the 70 years of captivity, his people are going back home, and the kingdom, we're there. But that doesn't fit with the visions. It didn't fit. What about those Gentile empires? It had to be, in his mind, it's conflicting. There's conflicting there. There's contradictions. It says 70, 77s are determined for your people. The word for determined, uh, it actually means cut off or cut out. There are 77s that are cut out in time that are for your people. <clears throat> And it's also for your holy city. That's Jerusalem. Six things would be accomplished during that time. <clears throat> now, it says in verse 25, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven and then sixty-two sevens. Okay, so there's going to be a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. It says with a plaza and moat and everything. So that particular decree, we've had several decrees. Remember when, uh, when the Medes and the Persians took over and they defeated the Babylonians? Cyrus said, go back. Okay, what did he say to do, go back and do? Build oh, build the temple. That's, that's correct. That's not what it says here. Restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Then we had uh, the decree of Darius. That's in Ezra, chapter 6. Uh, we also had the decree of Arctic Shakshaw in the seventh year of his reign. That's Ezra 7. You see, but all those said, go back and rebuild the, the house of your Elohim. Go back and rebuild the house. However, there is one decree that speaks of rebuilding the city and the walls, even in times of distress. That's in Nehemiah, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It came about in the month Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. That's how you say that, by the way. It's not Artaxerxes. All right? It's Artaxerxes. I practiced saying that a long time, several, to get this right. Okay? In the month of Nisan, that's the first month of the year, by the way, in the Hebrew year. Uh, the 20th year of King Arctic Shakshaw, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. By the way, he's uh, the wine taster for the king. You don't go with a, a cup of wine to the king with a sad face on. Okay? Oh, you don't look happy. No, I'm not happy. Kill him. Okay? You don't do that. 
You're, you're nothing but joy. You're going to love this wine, king. I know I'm enjoying it, but no, he's sad. And he said to the king, let the king live forever, but why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the Elohim of heaven. And I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant's servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governors or the princes beyond the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because of the good hand of my Elohim was on me. This is the only decree that spoke of rebuilding the city. And that's what he said, from the decree to rebuild the city. The... Uh, the 20th anniversary of the reign of King Artic Shakshaw, which is what we're talking about, the 20th year of King Artic Shakshaw, was in March 16th, 445 B.C. That's our starting point. Okay, so we believe we're dealing in years, and we are, by the way. So we've got to look at what constitutes a year. Look at the audience that we're speaking of here. The audience in... Uh, in the day of Daniel, did not consider a year to be 365.2422 days. That's not what they considered a year. They considered a year to be 360 days. This follows also the pattern that we see in Genesis with Noah, uh, where it equates five months with 150 days. And also, by the way, uh, ancient Egypt, Babylon, and all the surrounding nations all went by a 360-day year. Uh, Elohim is speaking to his audience in this. <clears throat> so, let's take a look here. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, or to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Now, if you read Nehemiah, when they rebuilt the city, what were the times of distress? The work with one hand and the sword in the other. Why? Because of the Samaritans. They were the problem. Even in times of distress. <clears throat> uh, it'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Why is that broken up? Why is the 69 weeks broken up into two separate segments? Seven weeks in 49 years, by the way, if you convert these to solar years. It takes you to the exact time that they rebuilt the city. They finished rebuilding the wall at the end of 49 years. <clears throat> but now we get to this thing about Messiah the Prince. You know, uh, then we've got 62 more sevens after this. Now, the guy who figured this out, his name is Sir Robert Anderson. He was chief inspector of Scotland Yard in the, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century early 1900s. Uh, he even worked on Jack the Ripper case, by the way. Uh, maybe it wasn't his best case, but he worked on that just as a, a point of reference. But uh, I've got his book and it's fascinating. He came to the conclusion, he, he, did the, he did the homework on this, and he got that starting date of uh, March 16th, 445 BC. It says, until Messiah the Prince. You know, when Yeshua was... Uh, was healing people, and he was gathering his disciples. Did you, did you ever notice that he always said, don't tell anybody? Okay, he always said, don't tell anybody. And look at Matthew 12, verses 15 and 16. But Yeshua, aware of this, withdrew from here, and many followed him. He healed them all and warned them not to make him known. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. In Matthew 9, starting at verse 27, Yeshua passed on. From there, two blind men following him, crying out, saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. And after he'd come into the house, the blind men came up to him. Yeshua said to them, Do you believe I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, master. 
He touched their eyes, saying, Be it done according to your faithfulness. And their eyes were opened, and Yeshua sternly warned them, saying, See here, let no one know about this. But they went out and spread the news about him in all that land. Oh, then Mark 1, verse 34, healed many who were, uh, who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. He was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Don't tell anybody. Remember when he turned the water into wine at, at Cana? On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Yeshua was there. Yeshua also was invited, his disciples, to the wedding. Uh, and when the wine gave out, the mother of Yeshua said to him, they have no wine. And Yeshua said to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Interesting. And we go to John's version of when he rides in on a donkey. <coughs> In John 12, verses 14 and 15, <clears throat> And Yeshua, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Look down to verse 23. And Yeshua answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour is here. This is the day. This is the day. <clears throat> Remember, uh, he was just telling them, Hey, this is the day. If they don't shout it, the stones are going to cry out. He just said that. <clears throat> and then he says, you know, they're going to level you to the ground and your children with you. And they'll not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The time of your visitation. Let's look at this again one more time. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from that starting point, until Messiah the Prince, there's going to be seven weeks, 62 weeks. Uh, the city's going to be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, so 69 weeks have gone by, Messiah is going to be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood, which means armies. Even to the end, there'll be war. Desolations are determined. We'll go over that in detail uh, in Luke 21. It was devastating. What, what, was, what did Yeshua do then? Oh, and when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it. Why? He knew it was coming. The, his day is here, and it ain't working. He knows what's going to happen. Because of Daniel 9. Because they don't recognize the time of his visitation. You take four, uh, 69 times 7 is 483. Okay? You multiply that times 360 days in a scriptural year, you come up with 173,880 days. If you divide that by 365.2422, you come up with 476.068 solar years. The decree, the, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was March 16, 445 B.C., which is 444.795 years before year zero. All right? <clears throat> if, if you take 444.795 and subtract 476.068 years, you come up to 31.268 CE. You have to add one because there's no year zero. You skip from 1 BC to 1 AD, okay, on your number line. There's no zero there. So between one and one, there's just one. So, and then the, uh, that comes to 32 CE plus 99 days. You can get your calendar out and add them up. It comes to April 9th, 32 CE. Or A.D., however you want to put it. If we project 483 years, 173,880 days ahead from the month of Nisan, March 16th in 445 B.C., we come to the 10th of Nisan in, C. E. in uh, A.D. 32. This is the day Yeshua rode into Jerusalem, proclaiming himself as Messiah in public for the very first time. I had a graphic made up here. I had my draftsman make it up. <clears throat> 
But Sir Robert Anderson even calculated when the new moons were sighted. Did an did a impeccable job. Chief Inspector of Scotland Yard, maybe you can trust him. Okay? And I went through his numbers. His numbers are impeccable. Okay? Check them all. It leads right to April 9th, 32 A.D. Passover that year was on a Thursday. Yeshua died on a Thursday. It wasn't a Friday. It was a Thursday. You know, one place in Matthew it says he'll be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Sure. Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. Well, not complete. It doesn't say complete. Because it does say some 11 other times he will raise on the third day. He will resurrect on the third day. He died Thursday at 3. Friday at 3 would be 24 hours. Saturday at 3 would be 48. But Sunday at 3, which well, he was up before the sun came up. Yeah. Can you put that on Facebook? Sure. Sure. Be glad to. You see, um, this is uh, this goes into the realm of "Are you kidding me?" type of stuff. Are you kidding me? Uh, people argue when he was actually crucified. Some say thirty uh, A.D. Some say twenty-eight. I, I just uh, I giggle. They try to figure out when the census was done and then add the years to that. And no, that's all right. I know when he was crucified. It was in thirty-two A.D. Okay, in April. Uh, <clears throat> and it was on Passover, April 9th, Nisan the 10th. He wept because you did not recognize the time of my visitation. And by the way, using this pattern, same exact pattern, you can calculate exactly what the abomination of desolation is. It tells you exactly when the completion was made of the Dome of the Rock, which is exactly that day. It tells, also using the same calculation, 360-day years, a day is equal to a year in prophecy. It tells us, it gives us in Ezekiel 4, the exact day that Israel would become a nation again on May 15, 1948. It gives us the day. Then it gives us the day when they took Jerusalem back again, June 10th, 1967, to the day, to the day. The Six-Day War. Yeah. Yeah. Remember Ezekiel was told to lay down on one side for 390 days, then lay down on the other side for 40? And he said a day equals a year. Well, if you read Leviticus, it says four times in Leviticus, I'm going to punish you when you get, go astray. And if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to multiply your punishment times seven. Ooh, you take that 390 times 7? That's a lot of years. That's a lot of years. Like 2,730 years or whatever. You go back <laughs> to when Israel was captured as, uh, in 725 uh, by the Assyrians, and you add that time frame up, it takes you right to June 10, 1967. If you take the 390 plus the 40 that Judah was punished for, well, they were, they were punished in Babylon for 70. And he says, if you still don't turn back to me, it's going to multiply it times seven. So you take the 430, they already were there seven, 70. That's 70 years of punishment. At least 360, multiply that times seven. From the time they destroyed uh, Babylon, or excuse me, from the time they, um, they were taken captive in Babylon, uh, that 360 times seven, turn it into solar years, you come to May 15th, 1948. I don't know what to tell you. But I'll tell you this. It tells you that whoever wrote, whoever wrote this, this book right here was no human being. This is the word of the Father. And there's things in Revelation. The same way. Time frames are given. But by the time Revelation came around, the, the, the thinking of the people had changed. They went by the Jewish year. Okay? And it, it's a moon cycle. It's a 19-year lunar cycle. And if you use that, a year is 364.868 days in a year. Use that equation and plug it into some of the things in Revelation and make your hair stand up. And it tells a story like none other, which we'll start after Luke. 
But all these things can be checked and verified. I, I'll, I'll certainly stand by them. Numbers are my thing. Love numbers. So, any questions on this before we move on? Chief Inspector of Scotland Yard found one little, let's say a template to use in interpreting time frames in prophecy. I don't know why I stopped using it. Don't know why I stopped using it. But I picked it up, found a lot of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. Luke 19, verses 45 and 46. He entered the temple and began to cast out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a robber's den. Well, he, uh, he threw out these people who were taking money from the temple in some sort of illegitimate uh, ma uh, manner. I, I don't know exactly what they were doing. Um, this, uh, this whole thing, he quotes Isaiah 56, verse 7. He says, my house shall be a house of prayer. And that's uh, down there in verse 7. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. He also quotes the Tanakh by saying they have made the temple a robber's den. That's in Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a, a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares Yahweh. And then lastly, for this chapter, and he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging upon his words. You know, Yeshua taught daily in the temple while the religious leaders were trying to devise a way to kill him. Actually, they didn't need to destroy him. All they needed to do was show the people where he was wrong in his teaching. And they would have left. But they continually failed in that endeavor. But they're going to try again. The text here says, for all the people were hanging upon his words. That's because he wasn't teaching like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was teaching purely the Torah of the Father. In Nehemiah 8, starting at verse 1, and all the people gathered as one, as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the Torah of Moses, which Yahweh had given to Israel. And then Ezra the priest brought the Torah before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand it, all the people were attentive to the book of the Torah. 